So we're going to start talking about a really fundamental aspect of cells, and that is cell division. And cell division is coordinated in this process called the cell cycle. And in chapter 12 of your book, that's the chapter that describes the cell cycle. And the book starts with describing the process of mitosis. And that's when the chromosomes or your DNA is physically separated into two daughter cells. But we're actually gonna begin the cell cycle in a different place. We're gonna talk first about how the cell copies its DNA before it physically separates it. So we're gonna be talking about the cell, cell cycle stage cause, called S phase. So the cell cycle is defined as the orderly sequence of events that leads the cells through the duplication of their chromosomes until the time it divides. And there are four steps to the cell cycle. There's mitosis, when the chromosomes are physically separated, as well as a gap phase called G1, a DNA synthesis phase called S phase for synthesis, and a G2 phase, which is another gap phase. And scientists knew for a long time about the existence of this M phase because they could see that chromosomes physically condensed and they could see that material separate into daughter cells. But they couldn't really see for a while what was happening in this other phase of the cell cycle. Okay, so they labeled this phase interphase, and that's G1, S, and G2. But eventually, through different technologies, scientists were able to observe what was happening in S phase. So the discovery of S phase came about through pulse chase experiments. And so in this experiment, they used radioactive thymidine. And so this labeled DNA that was being actively synthesized in the cell. So here showing in this circle here, the red tracks the progress of labeled cells through the cell cycle. Okay, so these cells that were labeled were undergoing this phase called S phase. Okay, and then they're gonna follow these cells through the different periods of the cell cycle. So what they first observed, so they, they radioactively labeled their cells with a pulse, and then they added the chase. And the first thing that they saw was that there was a gap between the end of S, how many cells were labeled, and the time it took those cells to enter M. Okay, so there was this gap period. So this was the first gap for those labeled cells to enter mitosis. Then in the next eight hours, those cells began to enter mitosis, at least some of the labeled cells, right? And then more of them, and then their DNA divided. And it took approximately another 24 hours for another S phase to start. So this was G2. So this is how scientists pieced together the different stages with the two gaps, flanking M or flanking S. So the, this is how scientists were able to decipher the stages of the cell cycle. But let's start to consider what's going on during S phase. So I would recommend that you pause and review the structure of deoxyribonucleotides and the mechanism of DNA polymerization. So if this isn't, if this isn't totally clear in your head, I would go back to that pre-recorded lecture and I would take a look. Some things that you, you wanna refresh on is the carbon numbering system. So here we have our sugar, our deoxyribosugar, and we've numbered the carbons one, two, three, four, five. And so you should be able to recognize that numbering system and tell me what's attached to the three prime, the five prime, and the one prime carbons. Okay, so take a look at that. Also refresh yourselves on the base pairing rules. Okay, so what pairs with adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine? And then looking at polymerization, refresh yourself about the rules of, of um, how DNA is synthesized, the direction of synthesis, and how in the double helix, the two strands that form the double helix are anti-parallel and what those different directions mean. So five prime to three prime, and then what the anti-parallel strand would look like. Okay, so you can pause, but I'm gonna keep going in this lecture. Okay. So 
there were several models originally to describe how these DNA strands would be um, would be synthesized. And the there were some really instrumental experiments done by Messelson and Stahl that settled a key question about replication. And I'm not going to talk about those experiments, but what they showed was that each parental strand separates and both can be used as templates for synthesis of a new daughter strand. And this process was termed semi-conservative replication. And it's called semi-conservative because the new strands each have a parental strand. So that parental strand is conserved. So let's take a look at what this looks like, okay? So each parental strand here I've labeled as, as five prime, oh, so five prime if you follow the red to three prime, and then it's anti-parallel strand going five prime to three prime in the opposite direction. Okay, so what happens is that both strands separate, and I have these mislabeled now in opposite directions. So both strands separate, so this should have a three up at the top here. And then this red strand can be, this parental strand can be used as a template for a new daughter strand shown in this darker red color that is anti-parallel. And the blue parental strand can also be used as a template for a new daughter strand. So this is the semi-conservative model of DNA replication. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk through the steps of DNA replication. And I'm gonna be introducing you to all of the important enzymes, okay? So we're gonna start a, a DNA replication at the replication fork. And then we're gonna go into how synthesis occurs on the leading strand and then how it occurs on the lagging strand, okay? And we're gonna separate these as one after the other, but they actually occur at the same time, okay? So the first key element of DNA replication is the origin of replication, okay? This is a specific sequence of bases where replication starts. And so here on a bacterial chromosome, right, recall that a bacterial chromosome, they have one and it's circular. And so this origin of replication is this specific base pairs, okay? And when the, when the bacteria wants to duplicate their DNA, this um, DNA opens up and new DNA can be polymerized in the five prime to three prime direction, okay? And this is called uh, a replication bubble when it opens up here. So eukaryotic chromosomes are very, are very, are much bigger, right? So just as a scale, right, E. coli have 4.2 million base pairs, okay? So, and, and they take about 20 minutes to duplicate their DNA. So 4 billion, right? Humans have about 3 billion base pairs, okay? So, and it, it takes them about 24 hours to duplicate. But they wouldn't actually be able to duplicate this quickly unless they had multiple origins of replication. So in fact, this is what happens. So in eukaryotic chromosomes, we have multiple origins of replication. So we have all of these different specific sequences where a replication bubble will form and DNA synthesis will start. So this is the replication bubble, okay? So just to review what I've told you so far, bacteria um, have one origin of replication and eukaryotes have multiple origins of replication, which sometimes I, I abbreviate as ORIs. When these replication bubbles form, okay, there's an area that we call the replication fork. And the replication fork is an area where the parental DNA is separated into single strands and enzymes assemble for this region to be copied. So in eukaryotes and, and really in bacteria, this process is highly regulated. So we'll talk about some of the cues in a, in a future lecture, um, but when cells are in G1, they're preparing their, 
to be for their DNA to be copied. They're making sure that there is no cell damage, no DNA damage before they're ready to duplicate their DNA. So this process is highly regulated. And in eukaryotes, regulatory mechanisms and regulatory proteins make sure that the DNA is copied only once per cycle. So as an example, there is a protein called geminin. And once this DNA is copied, gem geminin would bind to this area. This is a regulatory protein and basically prevent or act as a, as a roadblock for replication to, to occur again until mitosis happened and geminin would fall off. Okay. And I don't expect you to know the name of this enzyme, but just to make sure that you know that regulatory proteins make sure that this DNA is only copied once per cell cycle. And it would be very um, problematic if the DNA was copied more than once. Okay, so I introduced you to the origin of replication, and now we're gonna start assembling those, those enzymes at our replication fork. So the first enzyme I want to introduce you to is the helicase, okay? This is essentially the, the zipper, right, that unzips our DNA. Okay, and this enzyme catalyzes the separation of DNA strands to open the double helix. So what this is going to do is it's going to break apart those hydrogen bonds between, between the bases that are base paired. Okay, so I've, I've shown you this here. Okay, so now let's go back one second. We had our anti-parallel strands. So here's one strand going five prime to three prime and the other one three prime to five prime. And the helicase is basically going to unwind those, but I'm, I'm not showing you the unwinding step. I'm just showing you that, that once helicase is, is unwinding, we have a replication bubble. And we're gonna assemble enzymes to make this replication fork, okay? So we still have the strands that are anti-parallel, um, but these can, these can snap back uh, very quickly because the bases are more stable when they form hydrogen bonds. So the next proteins to assemble at the replication fork are these single-stranded DNA binding proteins. Okay, so I'm going to show them here in purple. And so these bind and they prevent the DNA from snapping back and reforming into a double helix. Okay, so we abbreviate these single-stranded binding proteins as SSBPs. Okay, so that's an important step to keep this unwound until we can start copying the DNA. The next enzyme that I'll introduce is a really important enzyme called topoisomerase. And I don't know if you've ever unwound Christmas lights, but if you just pull the, the wound up Christmas lights apart, what happens is you get these kinks, right? So if you cause by twisting forces, so you basically can pull and then you get jammed down the way. Um, in your strand. So topoisomerase is an enzyme that's going to help relieve that tension, those twist or those twisting forces. So what it does is it acts downstream of the helicase as the helicase is unwinding and it's breaking the bonds of DNA, right? And it's actually then rejoining the double helix to relieve those twisting forces caused by the opening of the helix. So this is always down the way, like little molecular scissors, just making little clips and then retying those clips. Okay, so, so far we've, we've set up our, our replication bubble because we've started to open up this, um, this double helix, okay? And now we're gonna start talking about how we're gonna build our replication fork, okay? And the, the enzyme that does the work here, so the enzyme that, that is going to polymerize um, the new daughter strand is DNA polymerase three, okay? I'm gonna talk about another DNA polymerase later called DNA polymerase one. So I just wanna draw your attention to this is DNA polymerase three, okay? And this is going to extend um, the, the DNA on the daughter strand. But this enzyme, it has some limitations, okay? It can only synthesize in the three prime, or sorry, in the five prime to three prime direction, right? It can only work um, how DNA is polymerized, okay? So let's consider this, this top strand here, right? And so we have three prime going to five prime, 
And if we build a daughter strand off this parental strand, it has to be anti-parallel. So that means that it's going to go five prime to three prime, okay? So this, because it's gonna go five, the daughter strand's gonna go five prime to three prime, it's called the leading strand because it's gonna follow, or the continuous strand, because it's going to follow along every time the helicase opens and the topoisomerase relieves that tension. This is just gonna keep plugging along in the same direction. The lagging strand, right, we'll talk about this one in a little bit, but it's gonna to have to go in the, in the opposite direction, okay? But we're only gonna focus on this leading strand right here, okay? The other limitation of DNA polymerase is it cannot start synthesis from scratch. Recall that these, these polymerizing strands, right, they need a free three prime hydroxyl, right? If they, if you get a, a chain terminator incorporated like AZT or um, the DDNTPs, you know, that we were using for sequencing, remember that question from the exam, DNA synthesis will halt, right? So we need to find a way to incorporate a three prime hydroxyl on a daughter strand so that DNA polymerase can act. And this is achieved by an RNA polymerase called the primase. Okay, so this is going to prime this process. It's going to catalyze the synthesis of an RNA primer. Okay, and a primer just refers to a complementary strand of DNA that will anneal or attach to a, to a parental strand. Okay, so let's imagine on our leading strand, we have the sequence GAA. Okay, so the primase, what it will do is it will catalyze the synthesis of a primer. And these are typically much longer, about 12 nucleotides. I'm only showing you three. And so this will catalyze complementary strand of RNA of CUU. Okay, and if we were to zoom in on this here, right, this, here's our RNA primer, we now have a three prime hydroxyl that DNA polymerase can start to act on. So now DNA polymerase can act, okay, so it's gonna be able to extend that leading strand and it will assemble with this protein called the sliding clamp. And this is going to help hold the DNA polymerase in place during ext extension so it won't fall off, okay? So starting from the RNA primer, the DNA polymerase three will start to add complementary sequences. So here we have um, an adenine for the thymine, a guanine for the cytosine, and so on. And it'll polymerize, right, on the leading strand going in the direction of the helicase. So just to summarize everything so far, this is the figure from your textbook. I just wanted to break it down in a little more detail. At the origin of replication, we have the binding of helicase and topoisomerase. This opening is stabilized um, by the single-stranded DNA binding proteins. The first step before DNA polymerase can act is the action of this primase that synthesizes an RNA primer. This allows there to be a free three prime hydroxyl for the DNA polymerase to act. Then DNA polymerase can be held onto this leading strand by the sliding clamp, and it can move in the direction, right, the five prime to three prime direction to continue synthesizing this new daughter strand of DNA. So that's how DNA is built on the leading strand. Okay, so let's consider now, what about that lagging strand, right? What, what's, what's going on there? Okay. So what happens here is we're basically going to make little bits of DNA at a time and then glue them together. Okay, so let's take a look at what happens. So we still have these single strand binding proteins. And what we have is we have an RNA primer, okay? And so what we're doing here is we're making a primer, right, with five prime to three prime. So now we have a three prime hydroxyl. And what's gonna happen is DNA polymerase three and the sliding clamp are gonna move now in this direction away from the replication fork, right? And they're gonna move, uh, keep moving down 
down this DNA, this stretch of DNA. Okay, and it's going to build this short fragment. And I won't talk about the experiments that, you know, uncovered this, but a researcher named Okasaki helped figure out that these short little fragments were made. And so this is called an Okasaki fragment, so this little bit of DNA that's made on the lagging strand. Okay, and it's made in the five prime to three prime direction. Okay, so this is actually happening. So here's here's the first Okazaki fragment. So this is made, and then you basically stop the bubble, right? So you can only go so far back because the replication fork is, you know, the bubble is still wind or the DNA is still wound up over here. So what happens then is this continues to move down is that a new RNA primer is assembled and the Okasaki, the second Okasaki fragment is generated. Okay, so here's the first one, right? And this is continuing to move down, so it's at a further location. And so now a second Okasaki fragment is built, okay? Now you can see here, we're gonna run into a little bit of, 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 of a problem because right now we have, um, we have, it's gonna encounter this RNA uh, primer and we want all DNA on our, on our new daughter strand, okay? So what happens is this is going to, this DNA polymerase three is gonna finish once it hits the RNA primer. And then a new enzyme is gonna come along and this is RNA polymerase one, okay? So again, this is a different RNA polymerase than the one we've been talking about. It's R D or sorry, DNA polymerase. This is DNA polymerase one. And it's going to remove the nucleotides of the primer. And it's gonna replace them with deoxyribonucleotides in the five prime to three prime direction. So it's basically going to be, an, you can think of it kind of as an eraser, right? That's going to fix our mistakes, right? Or the, if the RNA being the mistakes, and then it's going to look like one smooth strand. And this DNA polymerase, it does leave a nick in the DNA on this last nucleotide. And so another enzyme comes along called DNA ligase. And this is just going to glue or join those adjacent nucleotides together with a phosphodiester linkage. And so it's going to finish this and smooth out this new daughter strand. Okay. And this is going to happen as the helicase continues to move along and a third Okasaki fragment is generated. And so you should be able to predict, right? Okay, so this is our third Okasaki fragment. Now DNA polymerase one is going to act here, clean up this RNA, and then it's going to be joined together by the DNA ligase. So one of the features that we see during S phase, if, if we look really quickly, right? During S phase, what we can see is that there's a lot of um, little fragments that are generated at first, early in S phase. And then by the end of a cell in S phase, we see that these are all smoothed out and become these longer fragments because they've been, they've been corrected and joined together by DNA polymerase one and DNA ligase. So that's how this, that's how the lagging strand is generated, still traveling in the three prime, three, five prime to three prime direction. Okay, so just to just to kind of end with a big picture, um, I've, and the text and myself have represented these processes as independent, um, but it's a little more complex. So there's a protein complex called the replisome, replisome, and it's this large macromolecular machine, and there are multiple copies of DNA polymerase with the sliding clamp um, in, this, in this region. And then what happens here is in this complex, the lagging strand forms a loop so that the replosome can move as a single unit or single machine down, this, um, down the replication fork. A, cu a couple new findings about the replosome is that this machine is pretty dynamic in structure. So uh, if you look in E. coli, these, the proteins in this complex are, are being exchanged out with different proteins from the cytosol, right? Because remember, there's no nucleus in the bacteria. 
Um, and the continuous strand may not be as continuous as we previously thought. So that's just some new data coming out. And the rates of synthesis on the leading and lagging strand can vary. So those are just some, some new findings. I think that there's a lot of work yet to be done on this process, even though it's presented as though we understand everything. So in the next video, we're going to talk about um, some problems that exist with linear chromosomes and some mechanisms of DNA repair. But that's it for this video. Thanks.